two, one. Welcome to another episode of the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast. I'm your brother, old guy from Hip Hop News Uncensored. And sitting across from me is my co-host. What up, what up, y'all? It's your man, Sam Ant, CEO of Viral Hip Hop News. And you're in the building for a very special edition of the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast. We got royalty yes. in the building this afternoon. We got the God Grandmaster Kaz on the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast. How you doing today, fam? Yeah, yeah, all is well. All is well, brothers. Definitely appreciate you coming on, OG. We definitely appreciate when we can get people who have revolutionized the game, and you are one of those people, sir, and we definitely are honored to have you on here. So given this the complexion of where we're at right now in the world, let's start there. How you feeling? I'm good. I'm good. I mean, coming coming off the pandemic, uh, things starting to open up a little bit. You know, things are looking great. During the downtime, we had a lot of time to reflect, um, hopefully to educate ourselves I I know I did um, research and you know get creative and look for things uh, that once things start opening up that we can do and um, I did a lot of that and once things started opening up and um, you know those uh, those seeds that I planted are starting to come to fruition so I'm excited about it I'm feeling good physically and, and mentally good great and definitely uh, want to say we appreciate your contribution you know, to hip hop in the world. So let, let's talk about, let's go all the way back, you know, um, to the beginning, if you will. Um, what was your first contact with hip hop? I heard you telling the story about, you know, you first seeing graffiti. So talk, take us all the way back to when you was a kid and, you know, hip hop birth and then how you got first got in contact with hip hop. Well, before graffiti was considered an element of hip hop, hip hop, I was enamored by it as a kid. Um, I remember coming home from school and uh, waiting underneath the uh, overhead train stations and just standing underneath there for hours, just watching trains go by, watching all the new graffiti um, to see if Comet had a new piece on the train or end in a whole car or something like that. So I guess that was my introduction to hip hop. You know, once the beat became considered a part of hip hop, that was the first element. And then, um, you know, the block parties. Black parties is what really um, kind of established hip hop as an art form, and the local DJs became our heroes. They became the people that we looked up to, and the reason why um, I, I joined you know, the culture in the first place, I, I, I was just enamored by you know the movement, the culture, the dance, and the art. So you know, definitely I became a willing participant. Right. So at the age of 13, you grew up the street, um, grew up up the street from a uh, cool hurt. Talk about that. And then you, you mentioned Mitch witnessing the block parties. Was that like your first like you saying that like, oh, snap, like I really want to be a part of this. So talk about that. Grew up the street from cool hurt and witnessing those block parties. Yeah, I lived on uh, the, the first street up from Cedric Avenue um, in the Bronx, which is fell in place. And um, all the older kids used to empty the block like a couple of times a week and we'd be like yo where y'all going where y'all going and they'd be like we going to cool hurt party we going to cool hurt party and uh we were too young to uh, go to cool hurt party so we would hear tales about it and see, yeah, see them uh, coming and going um but eventually once outside and became you know um, to witness it uh, for myself and then I, I was all in. I was all in. Once I saw the DJ actually set up equipment and play, and the crowd come, mm -hmm. and the b boys come and dance, and, uh, it, it was amazing. So yeah, I was all in. How many young people at that time, who later on became legends, were influenced and inspired by those cool hurt parties? I think uh, I'd say at least half of of the first school of hip hop. <clears throat> was inspired by uh, Cool Herc. Um, if you talk to all the people, the early pioneers of hip hop, uh, from myself to Grandmaster Flash, Africa Bambada, and uh, Melly Mel, and, and most of the MC, all of us were inspired and um, by Cool Herc and wanted and aspired to be um, have that mythical kind of stature in a neighborhood like Cool Herc. So um, whether you're a DJ, MC, B-boy, or whatever, you, you know, you aspire to have cool hurt status. 
um, in our neighborhood. Right. So take us back to about 13. So, all right, you see the block parties, you know what I mean? You, you see what's going on. You're loving it. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. You start off, you know, dancing before you actually go to the turntables. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, up the street uh, from the park, central, from Cedar Park, where all the jams just take place. Um, up on Sedgwick Avenue, there was a building next to the firehouse, 1985. And it was in 19 or 16, 85, I think it was 16, 85. And that's the building that uh, all the guys from that neighborhood kind of uh, came from. And they had a, there was a group of them called the Casanova Crew. Mm-hmm. And they were boys. And the novelty about it was all of them was named Casanova. Casanova right. this, or Casanova that, or Casanova this. But casting over that. And I was like, that shit is cool as hell. That's mm-hmm. cool as hell. And um, I always considered myself a casting over anyway, even as a youngster. So I'm like, I adopted the name casting over fly. And I started dancing at parties and uh, eventually started my own little casting over crew. Um, I, I had to give the name up eventually, though, because when I became a DJ with that casting over. Uh, Grandmaster Flash had a security crew called the Casanovas, and they were not B-Boys. Okay, it was security. They were thugs, ex-gang members, and, and that kind of shit. And just to avoid confusion, um, I shortened my name to Cas. But my original name, Casanova Fly, came from those original B-Boys, the Casanova crew from Sedgwick Avenue. You know, the dope thing that a lot of people don't know about hip hop, unless you really do your research or watch documentaries and stuff, is a lot of it early on had no lyrics to it. It was a lot of a lot of dancing, a lot of beat breaking, a lot of changing of, of, of sounds and things like that. And it was different kinds of hip hop going on without outside of it, like your Frankie Crockers and your um, your Pygmy Markham's, Pygmy Markham, excuse me, and things like that throughout the, throughout time and throughout history. I want to know some of your influences in wanting to rhyme because you were influenced by hip hop on the music aspect. But what made you want to incorporate the lyrics into it and be the poet that you are? Well, early on in hip hop, it was all about the DJ. The DJ was hip hop. And um, you had to have a microphone when you played to make announcements. Um, it, it wasn't an art form at first. It was just, you know, little phrases and, you know, little sayings and things like that. Um, but the DJs who preceded the hip hop era, the, the club DJ, the disco DJs, and the radio DJs uh, inspired the first conversations uh, that we had in hip hop as far as rap is concerned. The call and response from DJ Hollywood and, and guys like that. Mm-hmm the storytelling, you know, the interaction with the crowd, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're playing music, we all got that from the previous generation. Um, like I said, the DJ Hollywoods and the, the radio DJs. Um, what, what changed it for our generation, how we changed it is that um, it was more street orientated. It was more um, conversational. We weren't just talking, we were, we were rapping cadence with the music and with the beats, um, creating stories and, and, and narratives and, and different things like that. So that's what drew me in, trying to expound on what was already there. So some of the first rhymes I ever heard were takeoffs or spinoffs from commercials, TV commercials or uh, um, cartoon themes or TV show themes. And I always figured, you know, you're, that's cool, it's kind of cool, but I always wanted to go beyond that. So. I, I had to play a dual role in hip hop in the early days, not only as a DJ, but take that microphone and uh, get, get creative with it. All right. right, now talk about the late 70s, take us up to about 78, 79, and your decision to um, join the Cold, Cru- Cold Crush Brothers you know, after they're already um, you know, uh, formatted. Formatted, sorry. I joined the Cold Crush like in late 80, actually. And if you look at flyers from back in the day, there's three different entities of me on, on okay. flyers. Um, you have the old Casanova fly um, identity, which um, I was kind of getting away from and moving into Grandmaster Cas. But it was still, I was still doing a few parties under the name Casanova fly. And then you had the Grandmaster Cas parties. And then you had me and my brother, JDL 
who were the only holdovers from those those crews before 79. And we became the notorious too. So if, if you, like I said, if you look at flyers from that era, you see Grandmaster Cass flyers, you'll see Casanova Fly flyers, you'll see Notorious 2 flyers, and you may mm -hmm. even see a Cold Crush flyer all in the same year. Okay, because that's how many kind of reinventions I, I was going through until I finally landed with the Cold Crush brothers. But that gave me the ability to not have to um, worry about DJ equipment, not worrying about the mm -hmm. DJ aspect of the show because Cold Crush brothers already had a, a marquee DJ on Charlie Chase, and they had a backup DJ, Tony Tone. So when I got down with them, I could just concentrate solely on writing, on, on, on MCing, on the stage show, and trying to make our crew competitive with the groups that were uh, out there at the time. Talk about those groups. Take me back a couple years prior to that when you had a blackout in um, the Bronx. I think it was like 77. I'm not sure. But, yeah, that um, was 77. That, def that was 77, um, summer of 77, matter of fact. And, yeah. Um, it, was hot. it was hot as the devil's nuts that summer. <laughs> and um, every time something happened outside, you know, it was packed. Um, we had a jam in the park. Uh, we had a battle against a crew called the Master Plan Bunch. And um, they set up their equipment. We set up our equipment side by side. And, you know, they play first. And then we come on and play. So it was my turn to play. Uh, my, my equipment started cutting off, and uh, you know the turntable stopped spinning. Like, woo -hoo, woo -hoo. first of all, I'm like, damn, we fucked now, we are fucked up. But <laughs> their equipment turned off too, and then the lights start going out, and then all the stores start closing around us and shit. <laughs> and slowly, people start realizing, you know, this is a blackout, and everybody headed, you know, towards the stores. Uh, huh. For 72 hours, the lights was out. And, damn. Uh, they created like a new wealth among the urban community <laughs> because they rocked the stores. You know what I mean? um, it, it created um, opportunities for, uh, I guess, um, in, in, in a small way for DJs because DJs who couldn't afford DJ equipment prior to that, I mean, they knew it everything. So speakers was available. Amps was available, you know, turntables is available after the blackout. And so that enabled uh, uh, the average guy to probably get into DJ. And others to fortify the sound system that they already had. That's when the influx of the group started really coming out right after that, right? So that, I mean, that was pretty influential. Pretty much. Well, we didn't have to uh, rely on, uh, like me, me, me personally, I didn't have to rely on being the DJ, on being the main man, on being right. responsible for everything. Now I could just solely concentrate on MC because there were other groups out at the time, groups like the Funky Four, who were one of the most organized groups in hip hop. I mean, they had management, they had a sound man, they had a, a sound system. They had, a, I mean, these was the only cats that we knew that had mic stands. And microphones. So when you when you saw the funky four, you saw a professional setup. Um, so uh, they were one of the first marquee groups. And then of course you got the L brothers, uh, which was Kevin Kev and, and Master Rob, his brother, and Ruby D. Um, you had uh, the Fantastic Five, who they eventually evolved into, who became our rivals. And of course yeah. the legendary Furious Five, with Grandmaster Flash. So they were the biggest group out. They were the group that every other hip hop group aspired to be uh, like or as good as or better than. All right. So my job with the Cold Press Brothers was to whip us into shape to be competitive with groups like the Funky Four and the Fantastic Five and the Furious Five. So that's what we did. For like a year, we went in the lab and uh, we honed our craft. We came out in like 81 and it was almost. Right. What do you? Uh, what's your thoughts on uh, gangster rap? And in your opinion, do you think that it ruined the true essence of hip hop? I'd like to get your thoughts on that. I think gangster rap was necessary, but I do think it ruined the fabric of hip hop itself. It kind of took you off the fact. Excuse me. It took you away from the, from the hip hop. You know what I mean? And, and made the conversation um, more important. Um, 
And it's not the conversation, it's it's the way you you say what you're saying. That's that's what the art of, of rhyme and the art of MCing is about. Okay. It's not about the subject matter, it's about the way you express that subject matter. And I think when um gangster rap came out, they, they emphasized too much it being gangster rap, too much mm-hmm. emphasis on the gangster part and not enough emphasis on the rap. And I think that that was a detriment, not with the gangster rap itself, but the you know the emphasis on the gangster part of it. And I think that influenced more gangsters than it did rappers. And would you put the more more of the uh the blame on the artist or the executive, or would you say it's a mutual you know um agreement for them to like you know? I don't put the blame on the artist. Uh, I don't think the artist is trying to exploit you know um okay. that particular you know part of it but some were you know what i mean because mm-hmm. west coast had to have had to find their own voice in the beginning of hip-hop west coast was emulating east coast or they sounded like um egyptian lover or arabian prince those those early guys that had that boom boom boom, 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 boom kind of groove you know that that west coast um you know, kind of electro punk groove um gangster rap is when west coast found their own voice and that started with my brother Ice T, and then with NWA, and then the floodgates were open after that. So it was a conversation that definitely needed to be had. But I think the industry and the media are who exploited the gangster part of it. Do you think because at your hip hop wasn't dead at that time? It was still going on. It was still very alive. But it got kind of pushed to the wayside, pushed underground, if you will, and more of that kind of music was promoted. Um, what yeah, was the scene exactly. like? What was the scene like when that transition was going on? Like, how did the elder statesmen of hip hop? What were what were your thought processes like when that was kind of when you seen that changing of the guard kind of going on? Well, you're talking about the golden era of hip hop prior to gangster music or gangster rap. The golden era of hip hop was happening. We're talking about mid to late eighties into early nineties. Right. That that's when uh, hip hop was so varied. You had so many different kinds of hip hop artists, so much hip hop to choose from. It, it didn't get boring. Everybody wasn't trying to sound the same. Uh, people mm-hmm. had their own voices and their own identities. There was funny rap. There was um, conscious rap. A lot of conscious rap at the time. Um, there were females into rap. There was party rap storytelling so there was a lot of uh there was a lot of content and diversity in hip-hop back then but what i think happened is that this is also the era when people were less involved with gold chains and drugs and stuff and they started wearing you know medallions and and, and being more conscious uh, mm-hmm. about um, who they are uh, knowledge of self and, and things like that Artists like KRS-One and Public Enemy started educating people about their roots, you know, and about their, their, their power and about the, um, the majesty that, that, that Black people have inside themselves. So I think that there was a trend to start, okay, wait a minute, let's, let's halt that shit, okay, let's halt all that Black pride and that, you know what I mean, and let's, let's, let's put some drugs out there, let's do this. Let's not talk about them guns. Let's get them guys to talk about the guns. And so I think it was the media and the industry that kind of exploited that and, and made that bigger than than the theme uh, of the conversation itself. Because I can think gangster rap is very relevant. Um, if you didn't know uh, about gangster rap or, or the gangster lifestyle, um, you definitely found out um, through that music. And if you travel like I do, uh, it's important that you know the climate of every place that you go to. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't want to get out there and, uh, in an all red jumpsuit and be in the wrong neighborhood and then you know get get your ass whooped or, or, or worse. And yeah. these are lessons that you learn either personally or you learn through that music. You know what I mean? You don't go out there like that. You gotta, you gotta be like that. You gotta do like that. This is how they rock. So it was educational. In a sense, but the way it was exploited, it was, uh, it was dangerous. Right. What's your thoughts on the, the current state of hip hop? Where, where it's kind of evolved to today, 
And um, you probably did an interview like six, seven years ago. Quick, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, do you respect any of the current artists in hip hop now? I don't want to put words okay, in. Okay, that mind. was a Vlad interview, and I was misquoted, right. or they just took one line out of everything I said. I didn't. I never said that I, I disrespect or don't respect any of the new artists. I didn't know enough about a lot of new artists to comment on them. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? So the current state of hip hop, I think um, hip hop needs an injection of some um, some pride in in the art form itself. Okay, I think the emphasis has been taken off of of the art form and the culture and more based on material things, on, uh, on commercial success. Now uh, today, people think that if you're rich or you can hold a stack of money up against you, that you know, you shit, you made it, you this and that. But as far as the culture of hip hop is concerned, that, that shit is menial, that we never did it for that. You know what I mean? Not to say that it's not a great thing that the young black people have been empowered by this culture and able to make that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Okay, but for us, it, it never was about money in the first place. This is something that we did for the love of it. And if there wasn't any money involved, we would still do it. I mean, we would also probably have to work and shit like that. But, you know what I mean? It, it, this this is a cultural, this is a thing that we do um, from the heart. Because it, it moved something inside of us when we were young. And that, that, that stays with us. I mean, for me, anyway, it stayed with me. So to this day, I'm hip hop at, at 61. Appreciate it. Indeed. Um, I want to I want to talk about something you went through personally back in the day and kind of correlated to what we kind of go through now. And that's the kind of the culture vulture era. And just follow me where I'm going with this now. Back in the day when Rapper's Delight came out, obviously there was some controversy that went on that a lot of people did not know about at the time with Hank, one of the members from um the sugar hill gang taking your very lyrics and putting it in the um song rappers of light and the rest is history everybody loved it called it the first song in hip-hop everybody went crazy and as i'm thinking and i'm looking at it and i'm watching it or i'm listening to the story i'm like damn as it correlates to now would that be like considered a culture vulture was that like culture vulturist in your opinion correct me if i'm wrong or, or how do you feel about that am i wrong in kind of feeling that way that that was like maybe one of the first culture vulture kind of moves if you will in him taking your stuff, going to a major label, putting this out to everybody to listen to and hear, not giving you any credit, and there it is. Um, I, I, I wouldn't consider it a, a culture vulture thing um, because Hank was within the culture. Mm-hmm. It's not like he was an outsider looking in. He was down yes, with me. Gotcha. You know what I mean? So if anything, it was like one of the biggest violations as far as culturally in hip hop. You don't fight other people around. You don't steal people's shit and go, you know, say it as yours mm-hmm. um, without acknowledgement. And and that's what that was basically. Um, friends don't do that. Um, they might do that in business. And that was the first um, kind of lesson that we learned that, that business don't have no rules, you know. Uh, the, the, especially the record business it doesn't have the rules and morals, you know, that, that hip hop may have culturally. It's like, you know, make it happen. I don't care who wrote it, who didn't write it, who this and this and that, bring it, wreck it, this and that, all that type of shit. So um, we, uh, a lot of us couldn't adhere to that that kind of mentality. So um, I know us as a group, you know, we never got it. We never caught on, caught on to that record shit and the way things are done. And so, uh, you know, our, our status, our historical status in hip hop precedes records and the yeah. fact that we inspired most of the people who came and made records monumental records later on is a testament to the to the culture of hip hop and not the business of Right. Would y'all say that y'all were the first to do like mixtapes? Because before even y'all y'all didn't have any real albums, you know what I mean, or anything like that. But back in the day people used to pass out y'all tapes and it's to be the live things that y'all recorded and be out there, y'all flowing and doing y'all thing. Would y'all consider that a mixtape? That was the first way that hip hop got spread. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But there was no internet or anything like that. Unless you saw hip hop live, it wasn't on the radio. It wasn't mm-hmm. on the radio till after 79 and, and only in little spots here and there. So not until the early 80s did the world start hearing hip hop. 
But our tapes are 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 the thing that kind of gave us notoriety outside mm-hmm. of where we were. Okay, we in the boogie down Bronx. We doing parties in the Bronx. If you didn't, if you wasn't at that party, it's word of mouth about what happened, who rocked, who did what, who said what, who did this, or you got one of the cassette tapes. Those cassette tapes uh, spread all around the country. You know, when you travel, you go to Grandma House, you go down south, you take the tapes with you, take the music with you, let your people see the yoga. That, you know, this is popping up in New York, such and such. Um, guys go into the military, take the music with them, go overseas, start meeting with people from all over the world, and start spreading their music, and, and that's how they are spread through those early tapes. So I would say, so I've never had a platinum uh, uh, record. Well, well, I got one recently, the back of one, but I mean, back in my early career, I never got a platinum album. Our mm. tapes went platinum. Word. Those cassette tapes, they used to sell in the streets, and guys used to, those are Bibles. Those are those are the holy grails to some of these artists. Talk to people like DMC and Rakim and guys mm. like that. Those, those are the tapes that they listen to like they was reading a, a thesis. Yep. Indeed. No doubt. T- talk about going back to the Cold Crush Brothers. Talk about Jay Z and him, you know, shedding light on that when he made we made his lyric um overcharged the niggas or what they did to the Cold Crush. What did that mean for you and how that, how do you feel when he said that? Well, I don't think he shed any light because to this day I don't know what they did to the Cold Crush. All right. I haven't got no call from Jay or on the <laughs> <laughs> Jay. Um Jay is clever. Jay-Z is one of the most clever cats, you know what I mean, as, as an MC. As an MC. And, um, and uh, lyrically, what he does is that he takes references, a lot of references to things that maybe the average person might not know and he can get that mm-hmm. to, uh, into whatever he's trying to, whatever point he's trying to get across so think that particular narrative. So I don't think it was a big deal. People start calling me, yo, Jay-Z said he did. Jay-Z, even on Empire, um, they, they repeated it uh, when Snoop was on Empire. You know okay. Uh, Terrence Howard said, yeah, you know, I'm overcharging for what they did with Cold Crush back in the day. Terrence Howard don't know Cold Crush from, uh, <laughs> from Tupac. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but but that phrase was, 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 was powerful. And uh, the fact that Jay said it, you know, made it more powerful to me. Jay was saying that I am robbing from the rich mm-hmm. in the name of the poor. Thanks. Now that's different from robbing from the rich to give it to the poor. All right? It's like, yo, I'm taxing all y'all niggas, but not paying the niggas that y'all should have paid back in the day. I'm charging y'all extra. That's yes, what he But we can do You know, he sent it to us. He's ridiculous, bro. Like I said, to us, it was a clever phrase. Let me ask you this real quick, trying to go back on Sugar Hill Game real quick. Did you and um, Big Bang Hank ever have a conversation? No, not really. Not really. You know, we talked briefly, maybe a couple of times after the Sugar Hill um, thing happened. Um, when it first happened, I didn't see Hank again for like two, two, two years. Mm-hmm. And when I did see him, it was like in the disco fever. Something that they had just come back from tour or something, and I'm like, oh, Hank, what's good? How's your mom's? How's your sister? Because I knew his family like that. Right. He was like, yo, we just got back from Miami, and we going to such and such. What are we doing? I said, yeah, I ain't going to ask you all that shit. And I'm like, I said, how's your family? So I saw he was like caught up in, in, in the rapture. So I just kept it moving. Uh, we never made. I mean, we never had a, no amends. We never came to no agreement and shook hands and like, you know, this and that. I just stopped, you know, I just stopped you know, getting, getting mad about the shit. I thought, wow, you know, it's, it's Kevin Mook. Uh, but we never reached no resolution. Uh, can't pass right. away, you know. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, without us being able to sit down as men and talk about what happened, you know, why it happened and, you know, come back together sometimes and that's unfortunate because uh, I uh, I caught the short end of the right I have you know what I mean 
And I went to his funeral, and um, the only photo of, of him, of me and him together, that was taken by my brother Joe Conzo, um, was in his, uh, you know, um, you know the family, and there was a photo of me and him, and my, my face was blurred out of it. Okay. Now, first of all, it's my photo. Right. Okay, it's me and my dad took that photo. It's the only photo of me and him. You know what I mean? You didn't have permission to even use it, but you're going to put it in his obituary and learn my face out of it. Yeah, why do that? That's what kind of bullshit is that? Mm. So, you know, like I said, I, I always caught the, uh, the Wrong man, that shit. I caught the short end of that stick, and uh, yeah, right. What, what's your thoughts? Um, I don't know if you've seen what's going on with Africa Bambada, but you guys, you know, were some of the pioneers in hip hop, and just recently, you know, he's being sued, you know, but you know, it's been rumors for years that you know he pretty much ravaged the Bronx w River projects, you know, messing with little kids. What's your thoughts? on that and currently him being sued for that um i just I, I i really don't have a lot of thoughts about it um if uh if he's found guilty and and this is somebody sort of this is not a um you know like he, he, he's got he got locked up he got accused of crap this is a lawsuit right yeah, it's a lawsuit. Yeah, I just heard about it. <clears throat> okay. So, he, I mean, he hasn't been convicted of, of a crime or anything, and I've seen too many things happen in the court of public opinion. Um, I don't know enough about it, and um, so I don't know enough to comment on um, it. If, if it's true, it's fucked up. Now, o over the years, did, um, did you ever hear any rumors? A lot of people said they heard rumors. You know, um, one that he may be homosexual, but one that he messed with kids. Do you ever hear anything over the years that seems strange that you would to share with the people? No, no, no. no. I mean, speculation because you might not have seen a man with a girlfriend. <clears throat> you know what I mean? But to us, he was like a community dude. He was like, you know, I, I know I never heard, I never heard talk like that. Gotcha. We <clears throat> transition a little bit. We had Cassidy on a couple months ago when he was talking, not even a couple months ago, when he was going through it with Tory Lanez. And he was saying that a lot of the rappers now, they don't value bars. They don't value true hip hop. He puts syllables together. He's putting two, three words together um, with two, three words and really kind of just admiring the art of hip hop. What do you feel about, I know we talked about it briefly um, earlier on, but the current state of hip hop and the lyrics and the lyricists behind it, What's your overall thought about what you hear and what you see right now? I'm not hearing a lot of lyricism um, with, with the current state of it. Now, now you would have to take out a few different artists and pinpoint, okay, okay now this guy or, or, or that guy or that particular guy, but I think this thing is about itself is kind of everybody trying to get the bag whatever way they can. Trying to make too much difference, you know, culturally or musically, um, except for uh, like a small amount of artists. Um, I wish that uh, I don't know. I just I just wish that there was some kind of control um, over what what we're influenced by. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we need to be a little more rounded. As far as the things that we take as our influences, then our music will step up, um, our, our culture will step up, our intelligence will step up. You know, when we start just accepting what I'm saying to us, it will start looking beyond that. Because uh, the, the game, the music game, is, is at an all time high. I mean, it was, it was commercially used. This has never been a better time to be involved in hip hop anyway, because there's so many different revenue streams. Mm -hmm. 
but that, that's what makes it suffer the culture. Right. Right. Now, talk talk about you know your lyrics, you know, pretty much being used in like college courses. How did that happen? And talk about that. It's like a work. It's like a work of art. Now you got a book and everything, but talk about that, please. I I, I really didn't know that. I mean, I, I didn't know it when I found out. I was like, "Oh, that shit is amazing." Yeah. I, yeah, I feel great about it. I feel great. Uh, my uh, my rhyme books uh, I donated to a corner of the university hip hop collection. So you can actually go there and look at my actual rhyme books and my old you know, penmanship, my old handwriting, and you know, decipher them, go through them, or whatever. And the book that you referred to is uh, written by the master jazz. I did my part of the art of the rap movie. I wrote an actual rhyme for them in the movie. And the producer was like, yo, your handwriting is crazy. Like Steve was like, yo, show me your rhyme books. Show me your rhyme books. I showed him some of my rhyme books and he said, yeah, this shit is great. It's all perfect in It's all shit. Yeah. So he said, you should do a book. That's what makes the book great. And it's about a collection of 40 or 40 of my rhymes in my own handwriting. So for people to study for that today, colleges and community, uh, or, you know, to you know, to learn more about you know, writing, to learn more about hip hop, or or you know, I'm blown away. Let me ask you this. Let me, I don't want to put a date on it, but outside of the golden era of of your era of hip hop, what's the, in your opinion, the best piece of hip hop work that you've ever heard? Oh. <clears throat> Out of all of the things that have come, come along, I, I can't think of one. Give me like two or three that maybe just come to mind off the head. Like that was a classic piece. Like that artist really did their thing on that. Uh, oh, oh. It comes to mind because the music was so powerful on so many different levels. Mm -hmm. And educational value. Mm -hmm. and, uh, inspirational. The first thing that jumped into my head was things like that. Right. And then, of course, uh, songs that changed the game or redirected the game. The first one being The Message, of yep. course, by Grandmaster uh, uh, Melly Mel and Duke Booty. Uh, Planet Rock by uh, the Soul Sonic Force. And, um, I think Run DMC's first record, Sucker MC's, kind of took, took everything back into perspective and started everything over and they created the next generation uh, for hip hop. Uh, later on, of course, Biggie's done some classic things. Um, mm -hmm. Jay Nas, Golden uh, 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 Era KRS One, just totally um, educated our culture um, throughout that era. Uh, Big Daddy King brought style and swagger back to the mic. Uh, Heavy D brought big boy prowess uh, to the dance floor, to the stage. So there were so many, um, so many eras that just fortified our culture. And uh, that was just something that we did that we came to the last year. Definitely. We got Grandmaster Cass here on the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast. Please, if you can, man, uh, leave your social media handles and any other announcements that you want to give to the people. The floor is open for you. Oh, well, you already know. Uh, Facebook, I'm Cass Brown. On Instagram, I'm The Real. Grandmaster Cass. Twitter, Grandmaster Cass. Um, pretty much, you know, my, my website, www.grandmastercass.com. Merch, um, GMCE got very inky.com. Uh, that's where my main merch and it's culture.com as well. You can always get all the cash merch. Just uh, a bunch of icon flowers. All right. 
Indeed. We definitely appreciate your time. We'd love to have you in our studio. If you're ever in the South Jersey area, have you live and hear some more great stories from the legend, the OG Grandmaster cast on the Hip Hop Ascensive Podcast. We definitely appreciate you, OG. Salute. No doubt. Let's make it happen, baby. All right, brother. Peace, peace. Peace.